Giving back to God cheerfully a portion of what He has blessed us with is an act of obedience, worship, and faith. And while it is important that we give, God cares very much about our hearts and why we give. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In thinking about why I give to God's work at First Temple, I reflected on how God has worked through the ministries of this church to cultivate spiritual growth in my own family. I give because in this church and just across the hallway, my babies have heard the message of God's love and plan for their life since they were bed babies through the ministry of preschool pals. I give because members of this church took their vacation time to go with my child to summer camp and sow those spiritual seeds of faith, even though it meant sleeping on a bottom bunk and on too thin a mattress. I give because in this church and through the ministry of family camp, my family could spend precious time together and with other families and focus on learning how we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind and to focus on loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. I give because it was members of our life group who came to our home to be with us and pray over us when we experienced sudden and unexpected loss. And it was our life group virtual Bible studies that helped me lean into my faith and God's strength and sovereignty as I weathered the pandemic as a healthcare provider. I give because I want your babies, your children, your families, and you to be impacted by God's love as mine has. I want you to know God's peace, hope, and joy. So I invite you as we enter this season of Thanksgiving and reflect on all that God has done and will continue to do through the ministries of this church. I ask that you search your heart and ask yourself, why do I give? And then I challenge you to take that one step further and write that down on the sheets provided at the welcome and information desks. These are anonymous as the goal is to lead to self-reflection and then to extol the greatness of God and how we've seen Him work and move for others to see and be inspired to. Good morning. Uh, so thankful for Autumn and our stewardship committee and their effort to put that together. That's awesome. Uh, and thank you, Gary, and the team this morning. What a wonderful time of worship we have already had. Thank you. You know, we are uh, just on the other side of this series where we talked about renewing our commitment to our mission as a church. In the seats in front of you, there are these cards that we've asked folks to take and, and consider filling out to, to re-up their commitment uh, to this church and what God is doing in our mission. Uh, we've asked that you consider doing that by January 1. It is not required in any way, but it is an idea that we might remind each other of what God is calling us to. We might have some practical thing that we can do to commit again together, and, and, and I need those things. I need reminders when things are difficult that help me push through and remember. I need sometimes to stop and think about God's story and what God has called us to before I can move forward. Maybe today you've come into this space and you are, are tired and worn out. Maybe you've been seeking after Jesus uh, for a long time. Maybe it's a new thing for you. Maybe you, you are just starting to ask some questions about God and you, and you look around and you think, but why is it still so hard sometimes, right? Why do I still struggle with things that I just think I shouldn't still be struggling with? Why are there still challenges? Why is this so difficult? I hope that today we are encouraged as we look to the scripture and see this text that will push us and challenge us, but hopefully mostly inspire us to keep going and give us some tools and resources as we go. Several years ago, there was a race, a marathon that happened. And at the end of the marathon, there was a photographer and he was taking pictures of people as they finished 
the race. And there was one photo that he took that went viral of this guy finishing a marathon. And I think that we all can agree that no one should look like that at the end of a marathon. He became known as ridiculously photogenic guy. That same week that this photo went viral, my uncle was running in a 10K. There was also a photographer there, and they got this photo of him. (laughs) He is gracious and kind to let me put it up in front of you today. And as a family, we laugh about this photo often. Ridiculously photogenic guy, ridiculously unphotogenic uncle, But sometimes I think in our life, it feels like as we are living the Christian life and seeking after Jesus, we feel a lot more like my uncle than the other guy. (laughs) Kind of worn out and tired, and maybe we look around and we think, it looks like everybody else looks like they're doing great. Why is this so hard? Today, as we dive into the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, we're going to see this invitation to press on, to not lose our hope and not lose our energy to celebrate with God and what God is doing. And we find some helps for things that may be getting in the way, that are maybe making it more difficult, that maybe we can let go. So if you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, it's a famous passage of Scripture. We're going to read some of the famous verses and then some of the not-so-famous verses. We'll start in verses 1 and 2 of Hebrews 12, and what's happening in Hebrews is Hebrews is basically a sermon. It's written to the early church, and these Christians seem to be struggling with some things. Things have begun to get difficult, and they're saying, how do we continue to go as things are getting hard? The preacher has just taken them through this famous section of the sermon where they talk about those who have gone before, of examples of incredible faith. And after that section, we get to chapter 12, verse 1. The preacher says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. So for the worn out, gassed Christian who is tired and not sure how they may continue, the writer says, you are surrounded. You are surrounded by those who have already run this race, who are in your corner, who are cheering you on. Perhaps today you might remember someone who encouraged you before, who pushed you before, who inspired you in your faith before. As we go, remember that you are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. And may that be part of the motivation to keep going. And as the preacher gets the people inspired a little bit, he then gives them some actions, right? He says, lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. What are the sins that cling so closely in your life? Sin is this rejection of what God has commanded, his desires for us. You know what these are for you. Ways that we've run from God, done things we know that we shouldn't, left other things undone that we know we should have done. In the scripture, it uses this language of of flesh. And the idea, this word for flesh, sarks, it's this idea of things that can be corrupted and can push us away from God. In Romans 7, 5, it says, while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. 
the writer of Hebrews is saying, there are things within us, dark things that we have let in, (laughs) desires and instincts that we know we shouldn't say yes to, and yet sometimes we do. He says, lay those aside. But I really think often those sins are are things that are reactions, are ways we are acting because of something that might be a little bit deeper. So he says not only to lay aside sin, but every weight. So my question this morning as we think about this race is what are you carrying with you today? What are you carrying that is burdening you and keeping you from running after Jesus, that is slowing you from running after Jesus, from responding and living like Jesus has called us to? For me, sometimes that might be cynicism. (laughs) For me, sometimes that is shame. Shame that says, I could never be good enough. God could never really care. None of this really could matter, so who cares what I do? I love in the passage where we look to Jesus and it says that he disregarded the shame of the cross. The cross was this awful way of execution that was designed to bring shame upon the person, right? That they were less than human or not valuable, and Jesus says, no, I don't believe that at all. In our culture today, sometimes we confuse shame with guilt. Guilt is something that happens when we do something we know that we shouldn't, like when you hit your sibling and you knew you shouldn't have hit your sibling, right? Guilt is about what, but shame? Shame is about who. One pastor says it like this, guilt thinks to itself, what I have done is unloving and I need to make it right. That can be a good and healthy thing to think Shame thinks, I am unlovable, and there's no hope for me. This is a lie. (laughs) This is a lie directly from the enemy. For each of us, all were created in the image of God, and none are too far from his reach and love. Perhaps today what you need to cast aside is shame. The next piece of advice the preacher gives us as we try to run this race is to run with perseverance what is set before us. Run with perseverance. You can tell by the use of this idea of perseverance a little bit about what the run will be like. No one has ever said, go enjoy a beautiful picnic in the park with perseverance. (laughs) Of course not. (laughs) We encourage each other to persevere when things are difficult. And so as we listen to the preacher, we understand that there is an expectation that in this race, it will get hard. So perhaps you are in a difficult time right now that doesn't mean that God is not with you or you're on some path that you shouldn't be on. That is not necessarily what that means at all. The expectation is that the race will be hard. And the encouragement is to keep going. And how do we keep going? The final piece of advice in this little section is that we would look to Jesus. That we would fix our eyes on Jesus and we would run that way. Because we know when we take our eyes off of Jesus, we start to veer. (laughs) Played a lot of baseball growing up and I knew when I was running to the base, I was supposed to run to the base, not look at the play. And yet sometimes, and it would slow me down, make me miss where I was supposed to go, look to Jesus. I remember studying this passage when I was in high school. First time I really had studied it, and I remember so clearly that God challenged me as I wrestled with it. So I saw this encouragement to look to Jesus and realized that I had spent most of my time looking at everybody else and saying, well, as long as I'm like a step ahead of these jokers, I'm doing okay. What is the bare minimum that I can look a little bit better than everybody else around me? 
But the command to follow Jesus is never to look at everybody else, but to look at Jesus. That this is our motivation. That this is where we are running. Not so that we might just try and try and try to do better, but that as we see Jesus and are so captured by his love for us, that he might transform us as we seek after him and can't help but become more like him. There's some more advice that shows up in this passage. I want to jump down to verse 14. The preacher says this, So pursue peace with everyone. Pursue peace with everyone. And that word means everyone. <laughs> The way of the Christian is to pursue peace with all people and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Saying if other people will experience this God you've experienced, will know this God that you know, they will know it because you've been changed by him. How could you tell them if you are not pursuing a way of living that looks like Jesus? Verse 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and through it many become defiled. Just let people know about God's grace and watch out for bitterness. The preacher understood people. <laughs> bitterness may happen. Watch out for it. And then verse 16, see to it that no one becomes like Esau, an immoral and godless person who sold his birthright for a single meal. You know that later when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no chance to repent, even though he sought the blessing with tears. What is this person doing bringing in Esau? <laughs> What does this mean? It's a strange little aside. Don't be like Esau. Esau here in the text said that Esau is immoral and godless. Some translations may even say something about sexual immorality. The idea is a life of, of wickedness. Where does this come from? Well, in the Old Testament, we have this story of Esau and his brother, Jacob. Esau is hungry after a hard day. He comes home, and his brother is cooking some stew. He smells the stew and asks for some. His brother, who is also not a saint, sees an opportunity. And he says, I will give you some of the stew that I have prepared if you give me your inheritance, your birthright. Give me everything. And Esau, being hungry, follows his passions and desires in the moment and says, sounds good. Later on, he realized this was a bad trade, but the inheritance had already been given away. Now, I don't know about you, but no one has ever tried to take my savings account for a meal of stew. <laughs> How might we become like Esau? This seems like such a strange illustration. But what we see in Esau is a person who in a moment gives in to these desires, these instinctions, these things that he has within them because he's stressed out and worn out and he doesn't think about the future and he just says, sure, fine, whatever it takes. Maybe when we think about Esau in this light, we realize he's not that different from us. The preacher is directly warning us as we run this race, knowing we'll be tired and worn out, knowing there will be difficult days to not then react to those desires. To not be people who just say whatever for relief, to respond to whatever they want in the moment, to give in. We are people who so easily give in. You know it's true because you've seen the little display by the checkout at the grocery store. They know that the magazine, the candy, is tempting. 
That we can look at those things and say, yeah, I want to look like that, be like that. I want to taste that. <laughs> we can believe the lies that say, I'm not enough. It doesn't matter. I'm not valuable. I'm ashamed. And so Hebrews is inviting us to be aware of the things within us that we must cast off and create new reactions and new responses. Today in our, in our world, it's incredibly popular to talk about, about habits in our world around us. There's books out that are, that are great, like The Power of Habit. There's a book called Atomic Habits, and they're all about how neuroscience is showing us that we are people who really are people of habits and desires. Most of our actions are in a response to our habits and desires that are in with, within us, and those things can be rewired. And so there are these fields of study about how we might rewire our habits to create more healthy habits in our lives. It's great cutting edge stuff. And the author of Hebrews knew it 2,000 years ago. He's inviting us to think about how we react to the world. Not by just responding to these things within us, but by being intentional about what we cast off. By focusing on Jesus, by persevering and knowing the bigger picture. This is not just a message that is saying, hey, you just need to do better. It is a message that is saying the Spirit of God, the same Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. And so if you focus on Jesus and you keep going and you believe what God says about you and you confess that he is Lord, these things that you might believe about yourself, these lies, lies that say I am not valuable, I am not lovable, I am not worthy, I could never overcome these things, I could never stop looking at these things, I have to give in to these things, they are lies. Focus on Jesus. The preacher uses the metaphor of a race because to prepare for a race, we, we train. If we are going to cast off things within us that, that we might react to it in ways, it will take time and it will take work. A practice that, that I have begun doing in my own life um, is a practice called inventory our reaction. And I want you to take a look at this and I want to challenge you with these questions as you go about your week because I found it to be really helpful when I think about how not to be like Esau. <laughs> so when something happens that, that, that makes me want to react and respond, or maybe I know that I already did react and respond in a way that was not like Jesus, and in hindsight I see that, but I'm already there, I can go back and I ask these questions. Okay, what happened? Like, what happened in this moment that made me want to react in a way that, that didn't look like Jesus? Okay, what am I feeling about that? So what happened? Maybe somebody said something about me or challenged me or critiqued me in a way uh, that, was, that was really painful. Okay, that's what happened. What am I feeling? Maybe I feel inadequate or maybe I feel ashamed. Maybe I feel like actually I'm not good enough or I'm not called or I'm not supposed to be doing these things that I'm doing. What is the story I'm telling myself? I'm not good enough. It doesn't matter. What story are you telling yourself in these moments? What story was Esau telling himself? If I don't eat this stew, I'm going to die. <laughs> what does the gospel say? Man, and all of a sudden, these things we're quickly responding with, we realize, oh, let me take a step back. <laughs> What does the gospel say? That you are seen and known and loved and called to something better, that you are a child of God, that you are a citizen of a kingdom, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. So question five, what counter instinctual action is required? How do I not lash out, not react, not wallow, not numb myself with some kind of substance or material. How do I keep going? How do I keep running? Because often, 
that's pretty counterinstinctual. As I think about this passage in the race and I think about my uncle, you know, uh, my family, we, we like to make fun of him about this picture, obviously. But the reality is, on that day, he was running a 10K and we were sitting around. <laughs> And so there are times that we are hard on ourselves because things are difficult. And you may feel like everybody else seems to have it going and they've got it figured out. And why is it so hard for me? Everybody does not have it figured out. It's a lie. (laughs) We are all running together and we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. And Jesus Christ is cheering you on is cheering you on, and there is no shame in running the race, even if you look a little gassed as you go. We are called to run, and you are running, so run with perseverance. Cast off the things that hinder you. They don't have to anymore. Focus on Jesus. And sometimes it'll work really well, and sometimes you'll mess up, and you know what? Keep going. As this is a familiar passage, I want to close today by reading it over you again, this time from the message translation, so perhaps with some new language on it, it may come alive in a new way. This is Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 and 14 through 17. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race that we're in. So study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever, and now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. So when you find yourself flagging in your faith, go over that story again. Item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through, that will shoot adrenaline into your soul. Work at getting along with each other and with God. Otherwise, you'll never so much as get a glimpse of him. Make sure no one gets left out of God's generosity. Keep a sharp eye out for weeds of bitter discontent. A thistle or two gone to seed can ruin a whole garden in no time. And watch out for that Esau syndrome trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. You well know how Esau later regretted that impulsive act and wanted God's blessing. But by then it was too late. Tears or no tears. The word of the Lord. Amen.